programs, it's Anchor Infernail, back once again with Runehammer, the Patreon page. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. Before I say anything, whoa, well, I guess I just said something. Anyway, I need to thank and welcome all the new patrons who have just showed up in the last three days. Unbelievable response. Almost 50 new patrons have showed up with their ducat to toss into the forge. Um, just since I posted uh, the new welcome message on YouTube. I'm really just trying to bring these communities together and also use the podcast to greater effect. You know, it's not always easy to deliver verbal concepts uh, through videos on YouTube. It takes a lot more pants putting on. And uh, nobody around here wants to put on any pants if they don't have to. So I, doing the podcast is a great way for me to just stay in touch on a weekly basis and, uh, you know, bring this method of thinking, the uh, so-called RPG mainframe uh, to the center of the brain frame, brain frame. <laughs> what was I saying? Welcome and thank you guys. Thanks for your patronage. Um, and if you're tossing just $1 in, help me out and uh, see what a great value I hope that is. I hope that is over time especially. And the real way that you can help me out is not to up your pledge, but just to spread the word if you really enjoy the Runehammer podcast and uh, let people know what's up. I know I don't do like tons of guest stars or music cuts or silly, uh, you know, gag comedy on this podcast, but a ton of thought goes into each episode and uh, trying to give you some in-depth listening so that you can, you know, get back to your table, your project and at least harvest one or two little goodies from the RPG Talks. So welcome, all you new patrons, and thank you so much for your support. Now let's just get into some Runeham, baby. Let's go up to northern Runeham area. Okay, today we're just going to dive right into the, the potatas, as I like to say, the meat and the potatas. So let me just open up my, my tome here, because I've been working on a nice, big, juicy piece of content. Now, you guys may have heard me mention this last week, but I wanted to try a podcast that was less about theory, uh, less about creative method, and more about a chunk of content. And so uh, they're a little bit intertwined, and I, uh, I wasn't even going to do mailbag day or any of that stuff today. I just wanted to dive right into this chunk of content. And you guys probably aren't out there playing Rangers of Numidia as a campaign, you know, you have your own players, your own characters, so on and so forth, your own storylines and situations. So I'm not presenting stills of Thusham, which is what, uh, what we're doing today, as a sort of, hey, get out there and play this adventure, guys. But I do think there are some creative tidbits in here that could really be fun for the next uh, adventure that you're working on creating for your players. So really, that's the spirit of this RPG talk is, hey, guys, check it out kind of put together a bit of an adventure here. And also there's going to be a YouTube video coming out, hopefully the end of this week, um, which is one of my most difficult videos I think I've ever done, which is, it's called mind mapping. And I've been working on trying to get this video into a dense sort of form for almost two years, I feel like. And I finally sort of had a breakthrough and it's all connected. That's also going to be sort of told through the lens of stills of Thusham. So for those of you who've been following Campaign Encounters on YouTube, you know that it all began with the uh, the Cavern of the Lizard Men and the Ruin of Westburg and then the, uh, what, the Wolves of the North. And then the Rangers came down and we had the Talking Head and then they returned to Westburg to Hathor Dur and we had the Tunnel of Hathor Dur. So the Rangers have been through a lot. I imagine that they're probably, you know, 7th or 8th level by now. And as many of you know, one of the rangers of Numidia recently met his fate beneath the Tower of Hathor Dur, and that is none other than Thil Stills of Thusham, who is uh, our goblin rogue, who's, you know, kind of like, hey guys, I'm the goblin rogue. Um, so in a sort of a amazing demonstration of heroism in the last episode of the rangers of Numidia, Stills sacrificed himself to lure this massive worm creature down and give uh, the other heroes a chance to escape, namely his best friend, Foxy the Fox. And so what I wanted to do is continue that story. Now, Zymer and Helm, if you remember, come up to the surface and they realize that now Westburg needs to be rebuilt. 
that there's a lot to do, that this this town needs to to feel hope again, and, and there's there's much to be done. And in my mind, they basically just claimed a player town, you know, like at this level in a campaign, I think it's a good time for players to to own, run, govern, rebuild, or assist a town as a headquarters. Um, I think it's a great preamble to a fortress. Um, to do a fortress before being beloved by a town is very unrealistic to me. The infrastructure and personnel and wealth it takes to really build or, or run a fortress, to me, depends upon a town. And that's the sort of feudal power structure, right? And so becoming the heroes or governors or rebuilders of a town to me, is the first step, and so here we go. So they've kind of almost claimed Westburg as their own, and they're leading the people to rebuild the town. Now, meanwhile, someone one day notices that Foxy has not been seen for weeks. Now, at first, Zymer and Helm are terribly saddened by this. I mean, she's one of their, their party. She's one of their companions. But she's also a wild animal, and so... Maybe, you know, the experience with this giant worm that was feeding on time was just too much. And she, you know, decided to recede back into the forests. And as weeks pass, you know, there's so much to do in rebuilding this town. They kind of let it go. You know, they say a prayer for Foxy and they're thankful for the time they shared together. And maybe Foxy has moved on. But the truth of the story is that Foxy never gave up on her best friend Stills. And if you were running an adventure similar to this, all this could just be your prologue. But Foxy never gave up on still. She went down into the Underdark, into this sort of shattered cavity or tunnel that's below Hathor Dur, which is the tower that's at the center of Westburg. She went down there and picked her way down through the rubble and down these cliff edges, down into the blackness, looking for stills, you know, sniffing and kind of hound-dogging and looking for stills, refusing to believe that stills was gone. Now, on the other side of the adventure, also part of this sort of big prologue, Queen Knife, who is the sort of ruler of Thushim, which is, Thushim is the, the northern settlement, for those of you who have ICRPG worlds, where uh, goblins sort of make their home, and this is where goblins are noble. They aren't these nasty little buggers. They're a good people, but they kind of keep to themselves because goblins have such a bad name across the world. They're not really bent on convincing the world that goblins are good. They just keep to themselves. So Queen Knife receives word that Stills, who's one of their greatest sort of wayward heroes, a great ambassador of the goblin people, has fallen in battle and has disappeared into the Underdark. And she, just like Foxy, refuses to believe that such a a resourceful and stout hero could be felled in such a way. And so she chooses a squad of her finest warriors and sends them to go look for him. Now, to make this really interesting, I would mix this group up a little bit. I would actually put someone in here who has a grudge against Stills. I would put someone in who hates the queen and maybe wants to betray her or betray Stills at the end. Maybe someone who's only going to find the riches in the Underdark and is really sort of greedy and will maybe turn on the group. But then also one, two, or three heroes in this group who are absolutely above table. They're, they are good, noble warriors or adventurers who are loyal to Queen Knife and, and are good friends of Stills and want to go find him. Okay, so mixing your party up a little bit somehow, be, be it through players or uh, maybe you're doing a one-shot and you're just giving these characters out as pre-gens, you know, whatever, can add a lot of depth to this situation. All right, so here's the big idea. And this partially comes from the um, the dungeon run, uh, which I think they called it the OSR dungeon run that uh, Abtab did about middle of last year. And since they did that, I was really inspired by some of the idea that they, they flipped, but I never had my own version of it until just now. So the idea of the adventure is not the going and the finding of stills. It's like, what? But Hankerin, you just built us up on this whole concept of Foxy and these these warriors being sent to find stills. Now you're telling me that's not the adventure. What, what the hell are you doing with me here? You're messing with my mind. When we begin the adventure, the group of warriors, the group of adventurers who have been sent to find stills and Foxy the Fox have actually already found stills deep, deep down in the Underdark in this dark chamber where he 
tumbled down a tunnel and maybe was dragged to this final place where he is unconscious. As Stills regains consciousness, and I would consider him one of the player characters of the adventure, as he comes to, that is the beginning of our adventure. Not the looking for Stills, not the finding, not the descending. And this is the twist that I want to introduce to you guys and throw out there as a table idea. The adventure is not the going after the treasure, is not the going after the goal, in this case, to rescue Stills. The adventure is to get out alive. So once Stills regains consciousness, him and this group of goblins and Foxy have to now get out of the Underdark. Now, you might your first response as a dungeon master should probably be, well, I mean, they made it down here this far, so they probably cleared the way in some way. I mean... We've all cleared dungeons and then exited. You know, it shouldn't be a big deal, right? Well, this is where you're going to get a little bit crazy. Is that Durathrax has caught wind of this group of adventurers. So imagine a deep, deep oubliette, a great cavity under the world, which is normally just dead silent. Maybe the, the creeping and scraping of tunneling worms and the occasional orc or beetle type creature can be heard. But otherwise, it's very quiet down here. So to have this group of goblins running around, meeting up with a fox and finding stills, this is like a lot of commotion for the Underdark. And I've been waiting to bring Durathrax, my black dragon, um, back. So Durathrax has been in a few of my adventures and campaigns, and it's just an ongoing character that I have. It's just, you know, even if Durathrax is slain by a group of players, I don't care. Durathrax is forever and, and is always somewhere in these great caverns and is always, you know, burning villages and, you know, plotting the doom of the world and so forth. I just love this character. Um, and so I bring uh, her back over and a- over and over again. And Durathrax I also really like because she can take this form of this sort of burning hag or this, um, this hag with fire in her eyes. And this has always gone well with me in all the adventures that I've used Durathrax. So I wanted to bring her back and bring her back in epic fashion. And this is what I wanted to do with this adventure. So Stills meets up with the goblins. Foxy is there, you know, licking his face as he wakes up. And he's like, oh, hey, Foxy. <laughs> but then off in the, in the darkness, off in the tunnels, they hear this huge grumble. Now, it's not a roar yet because Durathrax isn't angry, doesn't know where they are. But, like, basically, Durathrax is down here sleeping and smells them. Now, on the one hand, understanding the motivations of a, of a black lurking dragon like this is really important to the dungeon master. On the other, for the players, you want to reveal as little of the motivations of, the, of Durathrax as possible. But in my mind, Durathrax is both disgusted by this smell in the Underdark, but also sort of awakened like maybe it's feeding time. And understanding this notion of a black dragon that's been dormant for decades waking up to feed gives you a sense of how to run Durathrax. So Durathrax isn't necessarily just prowling around and lighting things on fire. She wants to eat these adventurers. So not even reduce them to ash per se, but to eat them. And that's going to give you a little bit of context on how to run her in battle and how to run her behavior and so forth. But not guarding a treasure hoard, not, not this type of behavior. She wants to feed. I like it. So right away, they're like, we got to get out of here. We have stills. Let's go. And this is where having an understanding of your map first becomes useful, right? Right at the beginning, the players are going to say, okay, what's the lay of the land and where can we go? Well, they have two routes. And this is where this adventure is a little bit different too. They have the way they came which is through a series of chambers and broken tunnels and cave-ins and rubble and so forth that leads back up toward Westburg. But then they have a way out the sort of the rear of this chamber that Stills is found in that seems more like the natural Underdark, like stalagmites, stalactites, flow stone and strange formations, and maybe even in the distance, the sound of lapping waves. So, Knowing players, <laughs> I would just guess that they're going to choose to go back the way they came because they want to get out of here as fast as possible. 
This is where Durathrax is your sort of no content left behind mechanism. So if the players choose the way they came, that's where Durathrax has kind of awakened and carved a new tunnel and shown up and causes a cave-in or frightens them or whatever. If they choose to go out the back way, the natural cavern, they discover the Black Ocean, which you can go watch my Moloch videos to find out more about the Black Ocean. And there's an island out there in the Black Ocean that they can see in the dim light. And if they go that way first, that island is where Durathrax is stirring and will sort of block that route. So you see, whichever one they choose first, you're gonna make the second one sort of a big part of the adventure. It, let me put it this way. Whatever they choose first winds up being a dead end. Now, I know that's a little bit brutal, right? Because it's like, well, that way there's no way for them to choose the correct shortcut. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is a brutal truth that a DM has to shoulder that a player doesn't want to know until weeks later, right? Which is that there was never a shortcut out of there. Whichever way you guys chose was going to be the dead end. You, ha you would have to turn back and go the other way. That's the adventure. So that's another idea that I think no matter what you're running at your table, you could probably bring that element to your adventure, right? So for the sake of argument, let's say that they try the way out that they came up toward Westburg. So they go through a few of these chambers and when Durathrax awakens, so do her sort of minions. And this could take any form of whatever your favorite underdark monster may be. And you could do kobolds, which are often worshippers and servants of dragons. Um, you could do some skeletons, you know, that she employs the undead. Maybe she's like that. Maybe it's the sort of the, the worm type character, you know, like the, the tunneling worms or boar worms. Um, you can really do almost anything as a, as a quickie mob. You want a, a disposable fodder mob to push them, to keep the danger moving, to make each room exciting. And then you want to start revealing little facts. And all these little facts are going to point to really just one or two bullets you have written in your journal, which is these are Durathrax's tunnels. So maybe there's um, eggshells that are laid around. Maybe there are bodies that she's fed upon. Maybe there's a huge scorched chamber where she breathed fire a long time ago. Maybe there are big claw marks. Maybe there was a cult down here that worshipped Durathrax and they have built these chambers where they would sacrifice to her or cook for her or, um, you know, care for her eggs or, you know, paint frescoes or sculptures of her. And all these facts and clues are pointing to one thing, which is that you guys have stumbled into the colossal underground lair of an ancient dragon. And you're going to play with this. You're going to do the rumbling sounds. You're going to smell brimstone. You're going to find the big claw marks. All this fun stuff while they're encountering some of these sort of mooky enemies like boar worms or skeletons, right? And this type of formula for adventure is applicable to so many different um, nights of gameplay. And so you can see where I'm going with this. So they start heading back up toward Westburg and then Durathrax, they hear this tremendous roar. There's a burst of fire. Everybody needs to make a save and the tunnel collapses. Okay. So when that tunnel collapses, if it's not enough danger to really send them running, <laughs> really send them running the other way, you can, you can up it. You can have the collapse unleash a huge swarm of these Mookie enemies. You could have Durathrax maybe show herself in the shadows. You could do something that's truly, truly terrifying that makes them realize we have to go the other way. And it's like, well, wasn't the other way like deeper into the Underdark? And yes, yes, it was. And that's the way we're going. Move right now. Go, 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 go. And it's got to be dangerous. And here's a place where a few NPCs can be handy because they can be disposable, uh, you know, danger indicators. Like you don't want to have to kill a PC to let them know that the danger is real. But this is where NPCs can be so useful. They make a dumb move, you know, they trip, their shoelace comes undone, and they are incinerated or crushed under a boulder or devoured by boar worms. Either way, they get this feeling like, oh God. So they have to go back down through the other route. And here's a great way for you to shift. So you did this whole first half of your adventure by introducing these chambers and these cave-ins and, you know, Whoa, maybe the great worm that was under Hathor Dur was actually one of the children of Durathrax. And like maybe killing it in the, the last Rangers of Numidia episode, like awoke Durathrax. Maybe she's mad about that. Maybe she's vengeful. Who knows? Either way, they run back down through the place where they found stills. 
and then out the sort of quote unquote back door, which is the more natural cavern. And here's a good place to switch the tone of your adventure. So go from your, let's say you did kobolds in the upper chambers, then you could go to, you know, um, slime cubes, boar worms, or insects or something for the lower section. So you get these two different themes. And then you want two different mechanics on these monsters. So they have a new monster to learn. And that's a big fun moment in a night. Maybe there's cave ropers down there, or maybe uh, cave fishers, right? Maybe these sort of um, pale, eyeless crabs or something. Like, oh, God. So anyways, they go down through this rear cavern, maybe encounter some mooky monsters. Maybe there's some creepy environmental components like a corrosive slime or slippery slime. And they find the Black Ocean, which is a wonderful scene to describe to players because they realize that the world is twice as big as they ever thought it was. So... Under the entire world, there is this ocean, which is sort of lightless. And it's in these vast, vast caverns, and there are islands of rock in this ocean. As they discover this black ocean in this huge cavity, up above from some opening they don't have access to, Durathrax like glides out through this space. And this is an epic moment. And she is big. She is big as, uh, as Vermithrax from Dragon Slayer, the old Disney movie from the 80s. And that's why all my dragons have a Thrax as, as part of their, their name, is that I consider them all relatives or de- descendants of Vermithrax, who is the, the dragon in that movie. It's my favorite movie dragon. It's absolutely huge <laughs> and really, in my mind, very realistic. Whereas I don't consider Smog to be that realistic. It's like he kind of has a person's voice. and I don't know. Smog is much more like high fantasy dragon. Whereas I consider Vermithrax just sort of just right to me. You know, it doesn't talk to you. It doesn't have lines. If it hoards treasure, it does so from some sadistic, ancient, pseudo-animalistic sort of point of view. But it's also highly intelligent and frightening. Wow. So they see Durathrax glide overhead and then glide out over this ocean and land on this island. Okay, so above Durathrax's island out in the, in the dark ocean, up above it, in the ceiling of the Underdark, there is an opening. And there are a few little rays of sunlight coming down through this opening. And the jagged rocks that form Durathrax's island almost reach the ceiling of the Underdark. Whoa. <laughs> so you have presented to your players this pot- potential escape route. But it is a gnarly escape route. But beyond this island, the ocean is just vast nothingness. It's either back up through, which would mean like months of digging and probably be devoured by boar worms, or find a way to climb this island and get out that opening. So here's where your players need to get resourceful. They probably want to rest on this beach if possible. They need to find a way to float out to the island, you know, make it several hundred yards out there so they can't really practically swim. And they need to sort of scavenge for wreckage, maybe from the upper tunnels. Maybe they even have some spells or magic they can use to cross some water. And they get out to the island, and now you have a very simple, very high stakes, uh, sort of story-rich kind of crawl. And what's the crawl? Well, you're going to go from room to room, from space to space, ascending. And that's going to be the fun. And and I think it's going to feel different. I don't think players do this very often. Now, the only example I know of from play that I've done in the last few years that's ascending is usually when players like attack a tower, right? They go in at the ground floor and they kind of go upstairs to go room to room to room. And you go up and you, as the DM, you design each floor with traps and with doors and different arrangements to hide the stairs and, you know, all those tricks. We've all done a tower adventure. And this is very similar, only this is natural rock formations. And the characters are ascending from space to space. They're always climbing. They're always going up. Now, what are your spaces here? Well, you've got your explanation for everything, which is this is where Durathrax nests. And so you can do eggs. You can do whelps. You can do cobalt, uh, you know, servants that tend to her nest. You can do skeletons where she's eaten. You can do a bone pile where she tosses aside all her rubbish. Uh, You can do her sort of sleeping place. You can have, and this is the best part of all, the actual encounter with Durathrax herself, which I would save for the upper pinnacles of the island. So as they're reaching these upper pinnacles, 
having gone through this sort of indirect path up through this phantasmagorical display of dragon scenes and clues. They reach these upper pinnacles, and there's actually four or five ways to climb up because, you know, it's kind of a complex, broken environment. And there's the opening. There's the sunlight just up above. If only they had, you know, 50 feet of rope with a hook or maybe a levitation spell or some way they could just cross that final, you know, maybe a really long ladder. (laughs) But then here comes Durathrax crawling up the pinnacles or gliding across the black water and making strafing runs across these pinnacles. But the players are situated, some of them on one pinnacle, some on another. Then one pinnacle shatters and creates like a stone bridge across and like you get this whole dynamic pinnacle environment with a dragon and an elder dragon, an ancient dragon, one that can cast magic, that can fly, that can disappear off into the ocean and then return at any moment. Massive breath weapons crossing these pinnacles. Maybe the characters can drop back and can fall back and hide in the pinnacles. Maybe they can draw her into the pinnacles, trick her into landing, and then topple one of these huge spike-like pinnacles down on her and crush her. Maybe they can find a way to get on her glide up near this opening and then use a grappling hook or a vine whip or some kind of spell to get hold of that opening. And then they're all climbing for the opening and she is enraged and breathing fire. Maybe at the end, she just wheels straight ballistic and goes up into the opening and smashes it open with her wings and flies out into the sunlight. And this opening is revealed as a sort of cavern entrance, which is a few miles away from Westburg. And so as this dragon fight unfolds out into the open, the soldiers and the cavalry of Westburg see it and they're on their way. And if the fight goes on long enough, they arrive to help. And oh my God. So that's the adventure. Now, exactly what happens? I don't know. That's up to players. So I don't want to write or decide everything that happens. But the way that I designed the adventure was I just sort of drew a crummy map, but then I kind of didn't. And then I kind of drew Durathrax, and then I kind of drew stills, and I don't really have it all designed. And that's when I wanted to present it to you guys here on the podcast, is at this stage, this is the the verbal stage of the design. I don't have the visual design. I don't have the mechanical room set up where it's like, here's where the door is, here's where the pillars are, here's where the treasure chest is. Because, especially for the sake of Patreon, I wanted to let you guys into the verbal, narrative, auditory, sequential part of my creative process. You just heard it. It was the description of a few scenes and conditions which may come in a certain order and which may not. Let's say they did the pinnacles first. They go out there, they do the pinnacles, they're trying to reach the opening, and she collapses it with her wings, and they are forced to go back up through the other route while being pursued by Durathrax in these tunnels. That's a totally different feel, but uses all the same variables that I set up, so I'm not taken by surprise. Now, you want to pepper all of these encounters and spaces with treasure, maybe a couple traps to make things interesting, maybe a few NPCs like an old spelunker who's lost down here, maybe a guy who, you know, a a valiant knight who was going to fight Durathrax and was injured and has been laying there for a few days, you know, this kind of classic stuff. Maybe you don't want to do mooks at all. Maybe you just want to do traps and scariness and then a big battle with Durathrax. Maybe Durathrax is dead in your world. Maybe it's just the minions and one of them is powered up because they have found Durathrax's skull. You know, you can take it a million places, but you have a few pieces of terrain, which is the set of tunnels and chambers that lead to Hathor Dur. You have the dark ocean and you have the pinnacle island with the opening in the ceiling. Once you have those, it's really just a matter of how to give it all luscious flavor and detail, which you're a dungeon master. You're good at that. And I think the big twist that might surprise your players is that you start the adventure at the bottom, so to speak, in quotes, of the dungeon. So you guys can see how once I start getting into the flow of these concepts, it just starts happening. I get very excited and I I get into that mode that I get into at the table, which is like, oh, well, there's this and then there's this and then this guy and then, oh, my God. And then he's like, and then the guy, oh, no, and, you know, his sword flew in the, in the eye and then he's got his foot and there's his claw that flies off and, no, oh, the claw's explosive. It's kind of like flint on the rocks and makes these sparks and then, you know, okay. Oof. But that's the piece of content that I want to throw out for this week's RPG talk was the idea of the rescue of Stills of Thusham. And whatever happens here, whoever lives, whoever dies, however it goes down, 
I would have either a, an epilogue or a follow-up adventure where Stills and the remainder of the squad and Foxy, they report back to Thusham, back to Queen Knife, and tell her the tale. And maybe they have to warn her that Durathrax is now out in the open and is angry. Maybe they slay Durathrax in a, in a turn of craziness. Maybe Stills doesn't make it out. Maybe he's killed. Maybe, and this is the worst of all, maybe Foxy doesn't make it out. In which case, like, they need to go to Westburg and they need to tell Zymer and Helm that Foxy died rescuing Stills. And like, oh man, there's several outcomes here that could all be very heavy and very tear jerky with a lot of gravitas to them and push your campaign in new directions. I mean, if Durathrax kills Foxy, it's it's all in to hunt Durathrax down. <laughs> so anyway, that's just the piece that I wanted to throw out to you guys. Once again, thank you everybody for uh, for showing up, all the new patrons. It's great to have you, and uh, really kind of enjoying getting into this flow of recording a new podcast every week. And you know, I might get into doing some guests on here. We might do some interviewy kind of stuff. Um, but generally, I like to just do the, the thinky mainframe and do some more basically just letting you guys in on whatever's happening in my journal right now. Now, like a fool, I did get like a 1,200-page journal. So if you guys have been feeling like I haven't done an exposed video on my journal lately, that is true. I've been working on this journal a year, and I'm only about a quarter of the way through it. So that doesn't bode well. So I'm trying to get a little more aggressive on finishing this journal because it's so thick and big. But we will get there. There is much D&D &D yet to be played. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so strength, honor, beer, and all that good stuff, you guys. I'll see you at the table. May your dice roll high. Thanks for tuning in. This has been Rune Hammer with your old buddy, Hanker Inferno. All right, keep it real. Don't steal. You always get a deal. I'll see you next time. <laughs>